Listen in on this week's Scientific American 60 Second Science Podcasts. I'm podcast editor Steve Mursky. Why did the chicken cross the road? Well, that's a philosophical pickle. But if you want to know why chickens don't get cross at people, why they're content being kept in their coops, science can help. Domestic species are interesting because their genetic makeup has changed dramatically as part of the process of going from wild to domestic. Lisa Lug, an evolutionary geneticist and anthropologist at the universities of Oxford and Cambridge. And indeed, when people have compared modern domestic animals with their wild relatives, they've identified genes that do show signs of strong reason selection. One such gene is thyroid-stimulating hormone receptor, otherwise known as TSHR, in chickens, a variant of this gene that is widespread in modern populations has been shown to directly cause chickens to be less fearful of humans and also result in reduced aggression towards conspecifics. But when exactly did the selection for these traits, and therefore this variant, take place? It's been suggested because of the potential usefulness of these traits in domestic setting that selection on this gene must have happened when chickens were first domesticated around 6,000 years ago in East Asia. But in an evolutionary timescale, this is just a blink of an eye, and we just don't know and don't have the resolution to tell when exactly between 6,000 years ago and now this selection happened, using data from only modern chicken populations. But with DNA from archaeological material, we can follow what happened with a gene through time, and in theory, spot when changes in a population occur. Lug and her colleagues examined TSHR gene sequences in the ancient remains of about 60 chickens found in Europe. And estimated that selection at this TSHR locus happened only around 1,000 years ago at medieval times. That is, 5,000 years after the initial domestication of chicken. Interestingly, this time period coincides with a substantial increase in chicken consumption known from the archaeological record. Historians suggest that a key driver behind these changes was the rising popularity and spread of Christian traditions, which disencouraged and also on occasions even banned eating meat from four-legged animals. But fowl were fair game. What is really exciting about this new study is that for the first time we can directly link genetic changes in domestic animal with cultural shifts in human food preference. The findings appear in the journal Molecular Biology and Evolution. This kind of plucky study is not just for the birds. Lug says the team is collecting canine archaeological samples so they can look at how man's best friend got divvied up into so many different breeds. Their research will no doubt be dogged. For Scientific Americans, 60 Second Science, I'm Karen Hopkin. There's a stretch of highway in Pennsylvania along US 422. And like every probably 20 feet, you see like a big pothole or cracking at the joint, like everywhere. It was so bad. Yagub Farnham is a construction materials engineer at Drexel University in Philly. And this road is pretty much his worst nightmare. Yeah, just imagine I was driving with like 60 miles per hour and I could see, I could feel it. Like uh, I was driving, I was so mad. I mean... What is going on on this? The culprit, he says, may be calcium chloride road salt. It's used to de-ice highways in the winter. Because calcium chloride reacts with a compound in concrete called calcium hydroxide to form another compound called calcium oxychloride. It's a huge molecule that causes a lot of pressure inside concrete and starts like degradation of concrete. The solution? Novel blends of concrete that use cheap leftover materials from the coal and steel industries, stuff like fly ash, silica fume, and slag. In his latest work, Farnham and his team created plugs of these experimental concretes and submerged them in salty solutions, along with plugs of conventional concrete. Then they eavesdropped on any cracking with high-sensitivity acoustic sensors, and they tracked heat flow through the material, too, to monitor chemical reactions. The results? Concrete slugs made with ingredients like fly ash and slag held up remarkably well after more than a month, whereas normal concrete was cracked to pieces in just a week. Their recipes are in the journal Cement and Concrete Composites. Farnham says some states have actually started using this sort of concrete because it's already known to make the material more durable against other factors, like corrosion of internal steel reinforcement. As for those cracks on US-422 and elsewhere, Farnham has another project in the works to apply a bacterial slurry 
which forms limestone when it interacts with salt, plugging up the gaps. But he says that work is still a ways down the road. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. We humans enjoy coffee and tea to give our brains a caffeine boost. And bees sometimes sip nectar that naturally contains caffeine, which seems to enhance their memory. Now a study suggests that bees enjoy another familiar drug produced by plants, nicotine. As it turns out, not just in humans, but um, even the bees seem to have difficulties quitting. Lars Chitka, a professor of behavioral and sensory ecology at Queen Mary University of London. Chitka and his colleagues studied bumblebees as they visited fake flowers that contained varying levels of nicotine. Unnaturally high nicotine concentrations deterred the bees. But at real-world levels, the drug attracted bees, and they even learned a flower's color faster if that flower offered a nicotine fix. And sometimes bees paid a steep price for this preference. They returned actually to flowers that had previously sold them nicotine, so to speak, even if these flowers now no longer contained nectar. Which might give nicotine-pushing plants, like tobacco, an edge. It provides these plant species with an unfair advantage over competing plants because they can um, retain faithful services of pollinators even if they're offering suboptimal nectar in this case. The results are in the journal Scientific Reports. And if caffeine and nicotine have these effects on bees, perhaps natural floral pharmacies stock other drugs, too, that enhance pollination and give bees a buzz. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. The other rocky planets in our solar system show a common feature. Within giant craters caused by impacts, there's evidence of volcanic activity, which made scientists wonder, can big impacts actually cause volcanic eruptions? And has that scenario ever happened here? To find out, scientists went to one of the few massive craters on Earth not erased by plate tectonics, the Sudbury Crater in Canada. Sudbury is a 1.85 billion years old impact structure. Teresa Ubide, a geochemist at the University of Queensland in Australia. Sudbury was generated when a bolide of 10 to 15 kilometers in diameter hit Earth. And what happened was it obviously generated a large basin and also melted the crust on top of the Earth at that time and generated a massive melt pool 2.5 kilometers in depth. But Ubidi and her colleagues found that the impact did more than that. It also seems to have triggered eruptions of magma that came from deep in the mantle. The evidence lies in the fact that the chemistry of the lava that erupted at Sudbury changed over time. At first, it matched the surface rocks, suggesting it was just from local melting. But as the eruptions continued, the lava appeared to come from deep in the mantle, suggesting the impact stirred things up inside the Earth. No one knows yet exactly how the impact could have sparked a prolonged episode of volcanism. One possible explanation is that after the object smashed into the surface, the crust would have rebounded upward, temporarily decompressing the mostly solid mantle and causing it to melt and produce magma. The results are in the Journal of Geophysical Research, Planets. It's hard to know if the same thing happened on other planets, Ubide says. In many spots in the solar system, it looks like volcanism happened much longer after the impact than what she saw at Sudbury. But without material to examine directly, we can't be sure. Nevertheless, these results do help explain a mysterious chapter in Earth's own history. Most major impacts on our planet happened about 4 billion years ago, when the solar system was still settling down. But there's no crust around from that time, suggesting the entire planet got a makeover soon after. We're suggesting that impacts are able to not only generate a crater, but also generate melting deeper, say in the mantle, and, you know, bring to the surface material from depth. So actually recycle and resurface. It seems the pummeling that Earth endured in the beginning may have triggered volcanic activity that helped wipe away the evidence of those early impacts. In other words, our planet took a beating that may have accelerated its own recovery. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Julia Rosen. (laughs) 